that every fact of science reflects the creation that he himself has made. And so I'm saying to you that that is the very foundation of doing meaningful science. But I also say that true science does not uh, preclude us from asking ultimate questions. And when it does, it becomes stunted and it becomes, uh, it becomes folding in upon itself. It can no longer ask meaningful questions. We have a long string of alleged biblical contradictions presented to us. I wondered if Dan would take the time maybe to do a little Googling around. I spent last month on my webcast going through every single one in the exact same order that Dan just presented them. Because I've been spending the past month and a half since I was invited to do this listening to Dan Gardner's debates. He used the exact same notes in the debate only a few months ago. And so I played every single one of his comments and stopped and responded biblically to each one. And so I invite you to listen to the dividing line for a full explication of each one of those errors, but I'd like to give you some real examples. For example, it seems to me uh, that to become a naturalist materialist greatly impacts your ability to do exegesis of the text of Scripture. Because honestly, I say this, Dan is a nice guy, but his handling of Scripture is horrific. Absolutely horrific. Do not know that Kami Ohani is one of the most common sexual variants in the New Testament. Uh, Dan himself, in talking to the student at GW, is that George Washington University earlier this year? That's George Washington? Okay, that was in that too. Uh, when he was talking to GW students, he said that his degree in religion was, as he put it, glorified Sunday school. So evidently, they didn't teach in the two years of undergraduate degree that he took anything about sexual criticism whatsoever. If he had looked at that, then he would know a lot about the, the transmission of the text in the New Testament and what he's saying there is not an argument in any way, shape, or form. I've written an entire book on the Doctrine of the Trinity, and you will never find 1 John 5, 7 cited in it as a foundation for the Doctrine of the Trinity. But one that is really troubling to me, because I think it, it addresses the issue of, of epistemology, is one in which uh, Dan has been corrected multiple times. He did a debate with Doug Wilson in 1997, and in that debate, he raised many of these same issues. He raised the question about, in the Gospel of John, Jesus at one point says, uh, if I testify to myself, the testimony is not true. There is another who testifies to me. That is the Father. He was referring there to the Jewish concept of having more than one witness, but an awful two or three witnesses. But then in a different context later, he says, even if I do testify to myself, my testimony is true. Why? Because I know where I've come from and where I am going. He makes reference to his divine nature, which takes it to a different context. Now, I've read Dan Barker's book, Godless. I've got his Losing Faith in Faith. And when I read him, I try to read him in context. Uh, he goes to this list, and he says, this and this, the crime of the scripture does not exist. Dan Barker once preached Jesus, now Dan Barker doesn't preach Jesus, therefore Dan Barker doesn't exist. <laughs> is that what <laughs> I don't think so. You have to allow for context, don't you? And the same thing is true in looking at John chapter 8. The same thing is true, I spent half, about half an hour or so, recently demonstrating that Dan likes to say, Rasak does not mean murder. And in the Doug Wilson debate, he got into an argument with him about the fact that, well, the Bible says, you shall not kill, and then it tells people to kill. And Doug Wilson said, um, didn't you notice that they were like within one chapter of each other? Do you think Moses was kind of himself? Yeah, well, if you'd known Hebrew, would have done that. And Doug said, do you think he knew Hebrew? This is Moses we're talking about here. And the fact of the matter is, if you simply look up, and I have on my computer, Bible works, I have next, all these scholarly resources, Look up any of the Hebrew lexical sources, and I've taught Hebrew, and you will discover that the central aspect of the semantic domain of that sock means to murder. Only by extension does it then become to mean to kill. And so it can mean that if context would just be allowed. And I'd like to invite all of you, if you're interested, if you found anything of merit in those types of arguments, look at the context of the text that Dan presented, and you will discover that there are Honestly, I can present to you a significantly better list of alleged contradictions. I really could. Those are simply based upon reading the text in a surface level fashion. And maybe that's what Dan was used to uh, when he did what he did as a self professing Christian. Certainly, the presentation of the gospel that he delineated to the students at GW was nothing like any other preached. But if that was the kind of exegesis he did, well, now he's still doing it as an atheist. And it seems a little bit odd to me. Uh, that you would criticize Christians for having a surface level view of the Bible, but then you turn around and use that very surface level view yourself. And when Christians try to say, well, you need to look at context, you need to make application of principles, then you're not somehow allowed to do that. I find that to be a rather inconsistent thing. 
Finally, in the just a few moments I have here, uh, Ed has often said for over a decade, just walk into any children's hospital and you know there's no good problem. I feel the weight of that emotional appeal. But I want you to try to hold off the emotion just long enough tonight to examine that assertion. Because I submit to you it is evidence that Dan has to borrow from my God to make his arguments against my God. The reason that a child is suffering the reason that a person dying, Dan closed with the debate he did once by reading a poem about it, a man whose, woman, whose mother was dying. And it tugs at the heartstrings, heart but it also demonstrates that the reason you and I detest death, the reason you and I detest sickness, is because there's something in us that recognizes what we should be and what this world should be. There is something evil about these things, and we recognize that. And I simply submit to you that a naturalist materialist has no logical or rational grounds arising from neo-Darwinian mutational evolutionary theory to care about what happens in a children's hospital. Natural selection is just taking place there, isn't it? But you see, here's the thing. Dan wants to get beyond natural selection. He wants to get beyond Darwinism because Dan loves beauty. He makes beautiful music. And I say to you, that is the glowing evidence that Dan Barker was created in the image of God. And deny his existence all you want, he still knows what beauty is, what truth is, what honesty is, things like that. And that's the inconsistency that we look at this evening. Thank you. Strong man attack. Yes, I did a radio show with him, uh, and he cornered me into saying which was something true, but then he went on to opinion and said, Oh, man, a human brain is nothing more than broccoli. Well, obviously, a human brain is more complex than broccoli, but look what James and Paul and Adam are doing. They're taking out of context statements that were made. My point in that is to say that in the big picture of things, in the cosmic picture, the total cosmic picture, we don't matter any more than broccoli matters. I never pretended that broccoli somehow has a functional complexity of a human brain or any other type of a brain. So uh, it's a cheap trick to set up a strong man and then shoot it down like that. Now, logic, language, words, thoughts, they are all functions, and James is right about that, functionalism, they are all functions of a working brain. And so is a mind, a function of a working brain. This is my understanding. I don't speak for all the atheists, obviously. But when the brain stops, the functioning stops. When the brain dies, the thinking dies. When the computer is unplugged, the software stops. It's because it's not, when the computer's unplugged, there's nothing operating, is there? The brain is an operating, functioning thing. Thought does not happen at the level of neurons, and there's another strong man that James is trying to set up. No one thinks that thought happens at the level of neurons. Uh, if you just read uh, Douglas Hoffman's new book, uh, I Am a Strange Blue, you, you see the, the amazing weirdness of uh, this epiphenomenal functioning at a higher level, obviously. And I did compare it to digestion as an example, in that as the study functions, it, produce, it does what we call digestion. Right? But no one thinks that digestion with a capital D is a thing that exists out there. There's no cosmic digestion. When the study stops, digestion stops. It's just a word to describe how something works. In the same way, logic, thought, mind are words to describe how this organ is working. They are not things. I, I repeat that this... Uh, argument that James makes is actually closing the door on science. Uh, are, you, are you suggesting that there will never be a natural explanation for the, for the way those molecules work? Are you, are you announcing to us by authority that science will never ever solve that question? And if you are, well, how arrogant is that? How certain is that? It boils down to a design argument. Functional complexity is amazing. It is incredible. If you see a watch on the ground like Katie said, or if you see the, the Computer here that James is referring to, we go, wow, look at you see a dam. But that argument has been put to bed a long, long time ago. In the simplest way of doing it, it goes way back to 
in, in my reading, look back at reading Dawkins and the self esteem, but even in his blind watchman. If functional complexity requires a designer, think about that. Something's perplex. Wow, it's amazing, right? It had to be designed. Well, the designer had to be at least as complex as what it designed, didn't it? Right? When you see a watch, you assume that a human made something more complex to make the watch or the computer. Or at least in a group of computers, like all of these, I suppose. Uh, a group of humans made the computer. So the mind of this being who created this complexity has to be at least as complex as the thing it made. And if your argument says that functional complexity requires a designer, if that's your argument, then it would be illogical not to conclude that the mind of the designer also needs a designer. If you're just going to assert the existence of this grand designer by fiat, then you don't need your design argument at all. You may as well just assert his existence. You may as well just presuppose the existence of this designer. It's kind of like a guy uh, who knows how in the world they make all those rivers to flow right on the state borders. <laughs> how do you explain that? Really? Think of the immense amount of engineering it took. Think of all of how, how expensive that must have been to do that, right? James is thinking backwards. He sees what he thinks is design, and he admits that natural selection is a part of the natural world, and yet he thinks natural selection has its limits. But scientists are repeatedly showing us over and over again the immense power of natural selection of accumulated small advantages over long periods of time that do result in exactly what appears to be intelligent design. It appears to be, but actually you can have design in nature without intelligence. You can have design by the limited ways, uh, arithmetically, that uh, atoms combine, or, the map, or geometrically, how molecules combine. There are certain laws, just basic laws that are not prescriptive laws, but just describe how things work. And the laws of nature are not intelligent, and yet they can produce design because of, of survival. Or like Julia Sweeney says in her play, there has to be a God because Look how perfectly the hand was made to fit inside the glove. Look at that. Four fingers and a thumb, right? We laugh at that. That's silly. But that's exactly what James is doing. He's looking at functional complexity and he's saying, how do you explain that? Well, he explains it with more complexity. He explains it with something grander. And my five-year-old daughter, Christy, she was smart enough as a kindergarten. She said, hey, Dad, you God made everything. Who made God? Now, when I was a theist, and I admit I had a, a not a great uh, education at a specific, it was okay. I've done most of my research and studies since then. And by the way, I found out that uh, I'm exactly right about the word Vatsa. And in my book, I explain the context. I think it is you who's taking out of context. I explain the usage of the New Testament word, that, that the word Vatsa means kill or even manslaughter, or it's something that even animals can do. I show that, I demonstrate that, I'm not taking those words out of context. I know what the word says. And besides this, it's all beside the point because God repeats the command not to kill with words other than rasa. So it's a smokescreen. It's a, it's a phony argument that we throw out to try to salvage the reliability of the Bible. The Bible has no explanatory power outside of itself. The Bible is, is uh, written by primitive people. Anyone who uses the Bible as an authority, and even, even James admits that there have been problems in the transmission of the Bible. And to his credit, he, it took me a lot longer, but he uh, rejected 1 John 5, 7. And if any of you are reading the King James Bible, get your marker and cross that out of it. And there are other parts of the Bible as well that should be crossed off. What this shows us, James, is that Christians, even way back in the early times, Christians were in the habit of doctoring their documents. Yes, they were. We even know they tampered with Josephus in the year 90. We know that Christians mess with the documents. Yeah. And then I, I guess I would ask you to define, use the Bible to actually define the word Trinity. I was doing a World Religious Conference in Canada a few years ago, and I sat next to a Hindu. And somebody asked the Hindu, how many gods are there in Hinduism? And I thought, how many gods are there? And he said, in Hinduism, there's one god. And everybody said, what? There's all these different gods. He said, the others are manifestations of the one god. And if there's just one god and the other gods. Well, I submit that the triune god of the Bible is polytheistic. It's a Christian way of trying to not look polytheistic, but there are one god and three persons, 
three manifestations of the same God in any place way of thinking, that is polytheism. The triune God of the Bible uh, is, is illogical and does not exist. 